place the real numbers onto a firmer foundation, we do find some of these properties that, that our group three raised here uh, are properties that, that hold up. So first of all, team one made the case that this repeating decimal is less than one um, in a variety of ways, one of which was to take a pie chart right here and say if this pie chart is equal to one, and then we take away this little tiny sliver that's smaller than any other sliver that we could take away, but it's still something, then the amount of area that's left there is 0.999 repeating. And because we took something away, that that quantity must be less than one. Then team two came along and said, no, these are in fact equal. Um, and did it through this sort of algebraic manipulation that we see over here, multiplying that number by 10, and then subtracting it and dividing by 9 to show that in fact it's equal to 1. But then if we don't know that this number here is real to begin with, then we don't even know if we can multiply it by 9, or if we could multiply it by 9, what that even means. So that's why Team 3's case was, to me, and I think for us this semester is the most important one of these three cases to make, um, because it's not clear when we're thinking about what it means for a decimal to have infinitely many places after the decimal. What does that infinitely many actually mean? It doesn't mean that the number is infinite, probably, right? I think we can agree that whatever 0.99999 is, it's some number that's between 0 and 2 on the number line. So it's not an infinite number, even if its decimal representation might have infinitely many decimals in it. Um, and then also turned up uh, a couple of properties that we will see again in the next three weeks, one of which is the Archimedean property, uh, that when we construct the real numbers uh, as the, in the way we're going to do it pretty soon, um, the Archimedean property is, is a big deal. Uh, it says that if there is a number which is smaller than every other positive number, then that number must be zero. Uh, and that was the case, that was what you all uh, in Team 3 used to make this case right here, right? That whatever this number is, it's somehow it's the largest number which is smaller than one, right? And so that's where I want to pick up our story. Um, because what we, our, our task for the first two thirds of this course, maybe more, is for us to understand what the real numbers are really. So where, where do they come from? What really is 0.9 repeating? And so here are a couple of viewpoints, and I think you'll see the, the breadcrumbs of these viewpoints in the presentations that you all made earlier today. If we call this number A for a minute, then one viewpoint on what A must be is it must be the largest number which is smaller than one. So there's that infinitesimals kind of viewpoint uh, that we were working on before. So if we take this viewpoint, then we might take the smaller than one idea and write a set. Let me call the set S the set of all rational numbers. So we don't know what the real numbers are yet, so we have to start from something which we know we can define to exist. Um, uh, Otto Kronecker, uh, has this famous physicist, has a comment, uh, a quote that says, God gave man the integers, and all the rest of it is human's work. <laughs> uh, and so if we can all agree that, that the integers are a thing, then it's not too big of a step from there to get to the rational numbers. But to get from the rational numbers to the real numbers is the biggest conceptual leap of all. Right? We know what the rational numbers are. They're fractions where the denominator is not zero. We know how to do arithmetic with them because it's integer arithmetic, just repackaged. But to get to the reals, we might say something like, well, let's take all the rational numbers that are less than one. And if I were to sort of plot what that looks like, it looks like this set on the rational number line that sort of ends up here at one, but it would end in an open circle if we were diagramming it the way we often do with the number line diagrams, right? And so whatever this 0.9 repeating is, we know that 0.9 repeating is... Well, it may or may not be an element of this set, but we know it's going to be the largest such number that belongs to this set. So we would say, in the parlance of, uh, of our course, we're going to say that A is an upper bound for this set. It means it's larger than everything in the set S, but that it's the smallest such number which is larger than everything in that set. And this will turn out to be our first viewpoint on where the real numbers come from. And that first viewpoint is, take any set of rational numbers that we can write down like this set S from up here. And then just decide that that set, if that set has a least upper bound, so an upper bound on that set which is smaller than every other upper bound, um, then that upper bound is something that we will declare to be a real number. So in this constructive viewpoint, if we define A to be the least upper bound of the set S because the set S is made of rationals, that's going to make A, by definition, a real number. So it's going to resolve the tension of is this or is this not a real number we would have to separately resolve the tension of whether that number is equal to one. <laughs> but at least that can be one way if we define the real numbers this way uh, to resolve the question of whether this is in fact real. So that's one viewpoint. The next viewpoint is another one that we heard about uh, from your presentations today. And I didn't even have to tell you, so great work. 
Um, the other viewpoint is that A is the result of taking and adding increasingly more nines at the end of a decimal, right? So we start out with 0 0.9, and we call that A sub 1. And then we add another 9 onto that, it becomes A sub 2, 0.99, right? That's a rational number. A2 is a rational number. A3, if I add another 9, it's a, still a rational number. A4, I can add another 9, still rational. So all these A's down here are rational numbers. So then where is this repeating decimal going to come from? Well, it's going to be the result of somehow continuing this process infinitely for whatever that means. And so it's going to be incumbent upon us to put a rigorous reality to what it means to continue that kind of process infinitely. Um, and as Team 3 told us a few minutes ago, what we get is really the infinite result of adding more nines. It's the limit of a sequence, as you said. Um, so A is the limit of this sequence of rational numbers. And this is the other viewpoint on how we can get to the real numbers from the rationals. Right? Take a sequence of rational numbers, and if that sequence of rational numbers can be said to have a limit, then that limit will be what we call a real number. So those are our two constructive viewpoints of where the real numbers come from. First of all, as the least upper bounds of sets of rational numbers, that's a principle that we're going to call the completeness principle when we meet it in chapter one. And the second is as the limit of sequences of rational numbers when those sequences have limits. Not all sequences have limits, uh, but those that do, we're going to call those limits real numbers. Uh, that's viewpoint number two. They also happen to align with goals number one and two for our course that you find in the syllabus. Uh, the first goal being to understand the axiomatic foundations that link the rational numbers to the reals. And the second goal is to understand uh, sequences and their convergence properties. So the two of those tie directly together. And these are the two primary roads that we can travel on to get from the rational numbers, which we all can agree exist, out to the real numbers. And the real numbers are scary country. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a fun journey, uh, and I look forward to making it with you.